Uh, you're all very welcome indeed to this, our 13th and final seminar in the Hosting the Stranger series, sponsored by Guestbook Project and the Institute for the Liberal Arts here at Boston College. The title of tonight's seminar is Hostility and Hospitality in Contemporary World Politics. And uh, anybody who hasn't been able to make it here this evening can watch it uh, posted on the website. Uh, it's a very special pleasure to introduce our first guest this evening, Noam Chomsky. And he will speak first, and after uh, him, we will have presentations from Ali Banabazizi and Stephen Fole. Let me begin on a personal note, if I may. Noam has been a good friend for many years now. In fact, since a number of visits that he paid to University College Dublin in the 1990s, when I had the pleasure of hosting him and his late and wonderful wife, Carol. They, in turn, were most generous hosts to me and my family when we arrived as guests and strangers on these shores in 1999, when we moved from Dublin to Boston College. I'm particularly grateful for the very warm welcome which Noam and Carol offered us at their homes in Lexington and Cape Cod. In fact, Carol was the first person to teach my daughters, Simon and Sarah, how to cross-country ski in their back garden in Lexington. And she also introduced us to the charms of accordion music, which she loved to play herself and which she enjoyed listening to, as I recall, on a number of occasions in Dublin pubs. So I'm very <laughs> grateful indeed to Carol and to Noam for their very gracious and generous hospitality. I should also mention that Noam is really no great stranger to a Catholic university in that he was baptized by his Irish nanny called Mary, unbeknownst to his parents, <laughs> <laughs> at a very early age. She kidnapped him and brought him to mass and decided she could not let his soul be damned in hell forever. <laughs> so Noam has a very early memory of a big white, a gentleman with a big white alb and water being poured on his head and various lights going on and off. Um, so there. Uh, <laughs> Noam, as you know, is a world-renowned philosopher, linguist, cognitive scientist, political activist, and author. He's written and lectured on these subjects throughout the five continents and is rightly recognized as not only the founder of modern linguistics, but also a very brave and uncompromising spokesperson for human justice and freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, Noam Chomsky. main themes of uh, current politics is the difference in style between the outgoing president and the incoming president. Uh, and in fact, the title of this uh, seminar is almost a metaphor for the uh, apparent differences between them. Uh, George Bush, especially during his first term, he and his administration where uh, the administration was marked by extreme hostility, uh, brazen arrogance, uh, contempt, uh, uh, it, so much that it alienated even uh, close allies, and the U.S. Uh, the U.S. standing in the world sank to its uh, lowest ranking ever recorded. Uh, Obama, on the other hand, is uh, his uh, sort of. Uh, radiates uh, 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 empathy and, uh, 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 and uh, 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 hospitality. And so, for example, in his recent trip to Europe, he welcomed the Europeans as partners instead of uh, uh, denouncing them as irrelevant uh, if they didn't follow U.S. commands. Uh, he reached out to the uh, uh, Muslim world to uh, Latin America, uh, offered a new era of friendship. Uh, he greeted antagonists with uh, handshakes instead of a clenched fist. 
uh, called for constructive dialogue and mutual respect. It would be hard to imagine uh, more polar opposites in the political spectrum. Uh, well, the crucial que a crucial question for world affairs is whether this difference of style is style alone or whether it's also a difference of substance. And that's not a trivial question to answer. Uh, to answer, you have to look behind, beyond the superficial rhetoric and investigate what's actually being said. Now, that's throughout history, uh, our history and the history of others, it's been quite common to find that a very forthcoming uh, hospital stance uh, in fact masks something quite different. So let me think about, ask you to think about a few examples which are deeply embedded in our own, in our own history, in our own culture, uh, right here in Massachusetts. Uh, actually a good place to start is with the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the 1620s, 380 years ago. Uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, as maybe you know, had a great seal. Uh, the great seal of the colony uh, uh, shows uh, an Indian with his naked Indian spears pointed down, sign of peace, and a scroll coming out of his mouth, uh, presumably because he couldn't talk English, uh, saying, come over and help us. Okay, that's Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, so the colonists then were responding to the plea of uh, the natives to be uh, rescued from their bitter uh, pagan uh, fate. And the colonists were showing the indigenous population the uh, noblest form of hospitality. We're coming here at your request to uh, uh, rescue you. Uh, this is probably the first example of what's nowadays called humanitarian intervention. We respond to the pleas of people to come and rescue them. And that's the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, and like uh, many of its successors, uh, as history has shown, uh, it turned out to be something a little different. Uh, and those consequences were not at all obscured to the agents. So for example, the first Secretary of War uh, General Henry Knox <coughs> described the utter extirpation of all the Indians in the most popular, populous parts of the Union, starting right here, uh, by means more destructive to the Indian natives than the conduct of the conquerors of Mexico and Peru, which was horrible enough. Uh, some years later, uh, John Quincy Adams, actually long after his own disgraceful role in these activities was over, uh, uh, described uh, uh, that he lamented the fate of what he called that hapless race of Native Americans, which we are exterminating with such merciless and perfidious cruelty, uh, something which went on after his lament and left very little there. And others, too, were no less aware of what they were doing as they answered the plea of the uh, Natives to come over here and help us. Uh, there is a more acceptable interpretation, and that's the one that's come down in history in one or another form. Uh, according to this version, uh, by the mysterious will of, mostly quoting, by the mysterious will of divine providence, the Indians just melted away like the snow in springtime as they were replaced in a natural way by a superior race. The colonists were blameless. Uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Joseph Story explained in 1828 that the colonists constantly respected Indians, but to the dismay of their Puritan benefactors, everywhere at the approach of the white man, the Indians fade away. We hear the rustling of their footsteps like that of the withered leaves of autumn, and they are gone forever. And we are left to ponder the wisdom of providence and to sigh at the constant sacrifices of this bold but uh, wasting race. Uh, that's 1830. By the 1960s, uh, a lot more of this, but coming to the 1960s, 1969, a uh, standard work of American diplomatic history uh, by a leading liberal historian could cheerfully relate that after their liberation from English rule, Americans turned to the task of felling trees and Indians 
and expanding to their natural borders uh, with no comment. That's normal. You know. uh, well, by that time, uh, providential explanations were less in favor, uh, though by no <coughs> means entirely. So, so when he was about to invade Iraq, uh, George Bush uh, instructed Americans that we do not claim to know all the ways of providence, yet we can trust in them, placing our confidence in the loving God uh, behind all of life and all of history as we proceed to carry out his will uh, by uh, going over there to uh, help them in Iraq, much like the Bay colonists. Uh, in uh, gratitude, uh, the survivors of this benevolence have chosen uh, as their uh, icon the now famous uh, shoe thrower. Uh, and quite generally, the victims don't seem to recognize properly the benevolence of their benefactors who come over to help them. Uh, and it's quite generally, in fact, wars of aggression and uh, terror have been framed in terms of what's called America's mission or the purpose of America and so on. And should add that apart from the religious overtones, which are more pretty specific to the United States, uh, apart from that, the United States is hardly alone in these postures. In fact, I won't go through the record, but you find you know, great uh, benevolence in the uh, uh, Japanese fascists uh, bringing an earthly paradise to the uh, backward uh, natives in China, Hitler, who was going to rescue the Czechs from the ethnic conflict and spread the German benevolence over them. And in fact, anybody you can think of, it's universal. Hard to find exceptions. Well, in internal discussion, you do find differences. So these protestations of uh, humanitarian concern, of hospitality and generosity, uh, they're often laced with cynicism and contempt internally. Uh, we're unusually lucky in this respect. It's a very free country, so we have a huge internal record of uh, declassified documents about what people were really thinking. And some of them are very instructive, and in fact, uh, I think, relevant to today. So take, say, the uh, missile crisis, 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, which uh, historian uh, Arthur, <coughs> Arthur Schlesinger Kennedy's advisors described later as maybe the most dangerous moment in history, which indeed it was. The fate of the world was at stake. Well, uh, Washington was making the decisions, and it refused to inform its uh, British ally of the steps that it was taking, the steps that literally threatened Britain's survival, as they knew. Uh, and uh, Washington, there is something called the special relationship between Britain and the U.S. And the, Washington's perception of the special relationship was articulated by a senior Kennedy advisor in internal discussion. Uh, he said, uh, Britain will act as our lieutenant. Uh, the fashionable word is partner. And Britain likes to hear the fashionable word. But the masters of the world understand the, uh, the real word. And uh, a cynic, or uh, maybe a realist, uh, could uh, interpret uh, Obama's uh, polite uh, gestures of partnership as resort to the fashionable word, word, which Europeans like to hear much more than abuse. In fact, they welcomed it with euphoria, uh, the departure from Bush's uh, brazen arrogance. Uh, but uh, we have to determine just what it means. Uh, colonists. Japanese fascists, others were also uh, not short of uh, very uplifting rhetoric. Well, to find out what lies behind it, you have to take a look at examples and look at them carefully. So take, for example, Iran. Uh, Obama was uh, greatly praised for his uh, New Year's message to the Iranian people, uh, which indeed was quite different from Bush's rhetoric. Uh, and uh, it was very respectful. Uh, he offered to uh, welcome Iran into the community of uh, civilized nations, uh, just a model of hospitality. Uh, there was a condition, however. Uh, Iran has to uh, renounce arms and violence if it wants to be accepted. If it, we're going to be very hospitable, you know, you have to react. 
Uh, just imagine yourself as, let's say, a Martian uh, watching all of this without the ideological framework that's instilled into us so deeply that almost nobody can see it. Uh, so here's what was happening. The uh, president of the most powerful nation in the world, which is occupying two countries uh, on Iran's borders and spends as much in armaments as the rest of the world combined, is telling the Iranians that they have to abandon arms and violence. I won't even speak of the record of violence. Uh, Iran. No, no, could you speak more into the mic? We have a hard time hearing you back. Then. Sorry, can't hear me? Okay, should have told me earlier. Think of all those precious words you missed. Uh, is this any better? These mics. I'll put this here too. How about if I just take this? Is that better? Yes. Okay. You can guess everything that came up until now. So just to go back one minute, uh, I started talking about Iran, uh, Obama's generous uh, hospital message to Iran. We're going to, we're eager to welcome you into the civilized world. But of course, you have to meet a condition. The condition is that you abandon uh, arms and violence. Uh, and now we try to abstract ourselves from our own uh, circumstances and culture and situation and try to look at this from the outside. Obama is the president of the most powerful country in the world with a record of violence that's kind of unmatched. It spends uh, about as much on armaments as the rest of the world combined. Uh, it happens to be occupying two countries, conquered two countries on the uh, borders of Iran. Uh, that's the one who's giving the lecture. Who's receiving the lecture? A country that has uh, a military budget which is approximately the same as Kuwait's. A uh, fraction of uh, Israel's military budget per capita terms, far less. Uh, hasn't carried out any uh, aggression for a couple hundred years. Uh, but uh, they have to abandon arms and violence in order for our hospitable gesture to be uh, uh, carried forward. And this proceeds without uh, a comment. And if you think about what that means, there, it means that there is an unexpressed principle. The unexpressed principle is we own the world. So therefore, everything we do is right and just by definition. Uh, we can make mistakes. Even the most noble people can make mistakes. But everything is fundamentally right and just. And if you don't accept that, you're the criminal. Doesn't matter what the facts are. And there are plenty of facts uh, which aren't brought up in, uh, uh, in discussion of uh, these interchanges. Actually, they sometimes are brought up. There was a good column in the Boston Globe a couple of days ago by John Terman, my colleague at MIT, who brought up the unspeakable facts uh, in just to take recent history. Uh, for over half a century, the United States, without a single let up, has been torturing the people of Iran. In 1953, uh, the US and Britain overthrew the parliamentary regime and installed uh, a tyrant, the Shah, who ruled with uh, brutality and uh, torture and terror until he was overthrown in 1979, and with almost no comment here on the crimes that he was carrying out. I mean, news cover, paper coverage was approximately zero. It's been studied, if you're interested. 1979, he was overthrown. And uh, very shortly, uh, the US began to support Saddam Hussein in his uh, war of aggression against Iran and supported him all the way through. In fact, supported him very strongly. In fact, US support for Saddam was so uh, unusual that Saddam was given really a, a unparalleled uh, uh, latitude to carry out actions that no one else can carry out. Uh, Iran under Saddam is the only country in the world that could ever get away with uh, attacking a US ship and killing several dozen uh, sailors. I mean, Israel did it, but you know they're the prime ally. But Saddam was able to do it too. He could do it and got away with a slight reprimand, the USS Stark in 1987. Uh, meanwhile, Saddam was using uh, chemical warfare. Uh, Reagan pretended not to know, uh, killing hundreds of thousands of Iranians. Uh, finally, the US basically won the war for Saddam. Uh, right after that, the US turned to harsh sanctions against Iran. Uh, and it continues without a stop. That's over 50 years of steady torture. Well, Obama has an answer to that. Uh, 
he says we should look forward, not backward. Uh, that's a very convenient stance for those who hold the club. Uh, those who are at the other end of the club don't usually accept it so readily, and this is case two. Uh, anyway, that's the uh, forthcoming uh, message uh, of uh, uh, President Obama to Iran, which was so much welcomed and praised. Let's take something that just happened a couple of days ago, the Latin American summit uh, in Trinidad. The leading issue, uh, as I'm sure you know, was uh, Cuba. And here again, uh, Obama was highly praised for a forthcoming move to uh, welcome Cuba to the civilized world. Uh, what did he do? What was behind that pleasant rhetoric? Well, what he did was to remove some of uh, George Bush's extremist uh, uh, conditions and go back to what was pre-Bush. Uh, the conditions that he removed were so unpopular that the, even the Cuban-American community was uh, strongly opposed to them. So that's the gesture. Uh, but there was no relaxation of the embargo. Uh, the embargo uh, is uh, condemned, and for years has been condemned by the entire world uh, for its uh, uh, savagery and even its criminality. But the U.S. is not entirely alone. In the annual votes at the United Nations, last one, last December, uh, the uh, United States is joined by Israel reflexively. They have to do what the U.S. tells them, even though they don't observe the embargo, and by a few Pacific islands. So we're not totally alone. And this has been going on for years. Uh, well, that's, uh, there's a reason for this. Actually, there are critics, like the Boston Globe, uh, who say that the embargo is a mistake. Uh, in the words of the Globe editorial a couple of days ago, uh, the embargo has not achieved its aim of hastening democratic change in Cuba. So it's not working, so therefore we have to change it. Uh, there is a question that should come to mind. Uh, how do the Globe editors know that that was the aim of the embargo? I mean, it's true that there's evidence. Our leaders say so, but that's not overwhelming evidence. It turns out there's other sources of evidence, which are quite rich, the declassified internal record. And that tells us what the aim of the embargo was. So I'll quote you a few things from the Kennedy years and the early Johnson years. So not from the right. This is kind of from what's called the left in American politics. Uh, the uh, problem of Cuba, we find out in the internal record, is Cuba's successful defiance, that's the words that are used, Cuba's successful defiance of U.S. policies going back to the Monroe Doctrine, 150 years. The Monroe Doctrine announced that we we're going to rule the hemisphere. They couldn't do it then. Britain was too powerful, but that was the uh, pronouncement. And uh, Cuba is defying it and successfully defying it. Nothing about the Russians, you know, nothing about communism, uh, starting revolutions or anything else. Just successful defiance of the master's rule. Uh, that's, and, and their, their uh, evil nature is illustrated as Kennedy's uh, Latin American advisor, uh, Arthur Schlesinger, wrote, uh, because of the threat of what he called the Castro idea of taking matters into one's own hands, uh, which is a grave threat to the hemisphere when the poor and underprivileged in other countries, stimulated by the example of the Cuban Revolution, are now demanding opportunities for a decent living. So it's worse than successful defiance. It's what's sometimes called the threat of a good example. Uh, others might try the same thing. It's what uh, Henry Kissinger called uh, a virus that might spread contagion. He was talking about Allende's Chile, which we got rid of on uh, what in Latin America is called the first 9-11, uh, worse than the second one, in fact. Uh, but we took care of that, but Chile was a like Cuba is a virus spreading contagion, uh, maybe as far as Europe where uh, social democratic parties might see Allende's success as an indication that parliamentary methods can be used to institute social change, and obviously you can't have that or the whole world system falls apart. In fact, if you look through Cold War history, honestly, you'll find that that was the leading theme constantly. I mean, it's dressed up as communist aggression and so on, you know, Nicaragua's going to invade us, uh, Grenada 
has an air base which the Russians can use to bomb us if they can find it on the map and one thing after another. Uh, but the real concern is pretty much the same wherever we have records. Uh, uh, successful independent development might inspire others to try the same thing. Vietnam War was the same. Uh, so yes, that's the reason for, that's the threat of Cuba, very precisely explained in the internal record. And uh, therefore, uh, you have to take obvious steps. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, and the steps were described. Uh, we have to uh, uh, punish the Cuban people. It was immediately decided a few months after Castro's takeover. We have to punish the Cuban people to compel them to overthrow the government. Uh, in 1960, the State Department uh, uh, said that Castro could, would be removed through disenchantment and disaffection based on economic dissatisfaction and hardship, and every possible means should be undertaken promptly to weaken the economic life of Cuba in order to bring about hunger, desperation, and the overthrow of the government. Uh, Eisenhower was then president, approved of sanctions in the expectation that uh, if the Cuban people are hungry, they will throw Castro out. Kennedy came in shortly after, and he agreed that the uh, em embargo would hasten uh, Castro's departure as a result of the rising discomfort among hungry Cubans. Uh, Kennedy also initiated a major terrorist campaign. Uh, its goal was to bring the terrors of the earth to Cuba. In the words of uh, historian Arthur Schlesinger, his Latin American advisor, uh, writing the semi-official biography of Robert Kennedy to whom this task was assigned, bring the terrors of the earth to Cuba. And it was no joke. Uh, all of this has disappeared into the mists of uh, history like uh, withered leaves of autumn, you know, like the natives who used to uh, con contaminate these shores. Uh, and again, we must uh, look uh, forward, uh, not backwards in Obama's words, and uh, uh, we, well, critics, there are critics, and they lament the failure of our effort, our noble effort to bring the blessings of democracy, uh, namely by violence and economic strangulation to punish the people for their uh, disobedience and uh, successful defiance and for their uh, threatening to uh, present a model that others might want to follow. Uh, incidentally, all of this is done over the objections of a large majority of the population of the United States, uh, which for decades has been in favor of calling for uh, a normalization of relations with Cuba. Uh, it's not only the same is true with Iran, but uh, these are the strange ways of democracy. Meanwhile, we're trying to bring them democracy. Uh, well, the uh, concept of humanitarian intervention has come a long way since its origins and the uh, great seal of the Massachusetts Bay Colony since the Puritans offered their hospitality to the Indians who were pleading with them to come over and help us. Uh, at the end of the last millennium, it had become uh, the, the favorite concept of uh, the intellectual classes in the United States, also in, in, in the West generally. Uh, they were deeply impressed by the fact that after the digression in the Cold War, which sort of, uh, you know, sort of diverted us from our great mission. Uh, after this digression, uh, uh, American foreign policy, I'm quoting from now on, American foreign policy had entered a noble phase with a saintly glow as the idealistic new world bent on saving humanity was acting from altruism alone on the basis of principles and values for the first time in history, adopting what's called the responsibility to protect and carrying out actions that were indeed illegal, as recognized, but were legitimate uh, because uh, of the nobility of the mission. Actually, I'm quoting from highly respected liberal sources uh, uh, in a chorus of self-congratulation that I don't think has any counterpart in history. At least I can't find one. It was an astonishing chorus in the last years of the millennium. Uh, and there was an issue. The issue was the bombing of Serbia. That's what demonstrated the fantastic nobility of our uh, altruism 
there are, uh, there's, there's a story about it. The bombing was undertaken to prevent the ongoing genocide of Kosovars. There are a couple of problems with the story. Uh, one is that the uh, atrocities weren't the cause of the uh, bombing, they were the consequence of it. Uh, the bombing, in fact, as was anticipated, clearly anticipated, uh, sharply escalated the level of atrocities, uh, which before that, you know, it's not pretty, but kind of by comparative standards, limited and uh, a split between Serbs and uh, uh, KLA, Kosovar guerrillas. But the bombing, as anticipated, General Clark uh, warned Washington that this was happened. He, in fact, informed the press. Uh, right after the bombing started, of course, there was a sharp increase in atrocities, as expected. Uh, and uh, began the flow of refugees and all the terrible stories you read. Uh, that was actually revealed in the indictment of uh, Milosevic. But the commentators here were polite enough not pretend not to notice it. Uh, he was indicted in the middle of the bombing. But if you look at the indictment, it was almost entirely for alleged crimes after the bombing. There was one dubious exception, but even if you believe it, uh, it was almost entirely for the result of the bombing and the anticipated result. So it couldn't be that we were uh, uh, bombing to save the uh, Kosovars from genocide. Uh, uh, rather obvious what was going on and is sometimes even conceded. Uh, another little flaw in the argument is that at the same time that uh, the US and Britain were uh, in the noble phase of their foreign policy with the saintly glow, uh, they were not only tolerating but actively supporting, uh, decisively supporting uh, crimes and atrocities that were well beyond anything reported in Kosovo. But that's another minor difficulty, just fact. Facts don't really matter uh, in uh, these affairs. Uh, now, the cynicism uh, can be kept hidden in the rich and powerful countries, the ones who hold the clubs. You know, we can keep it hidden from ourselves. But it's not, uh, it's not hard for others to see. In fact, they are well aware of it. Uh, as usual, what they say is silenced, but if you work, you can hear it. So, for example, right after the bombing of Serbia, there was a meeting of the South Summit. Uh, the heads of state of the <coughs> non-line countries, G77, most of the world, in fact. And uh, they had a bitter condemn condemnation of the bombing and also of the, uh, what they called the, uh, the so-called right of humanitarian intervention. They condemned that as just a cover for traditional imperialism. Uh, that was kept silent. Uh, a couple of years later, the uh, United Nations had a high-level commission uh, to, on the notion of responsibility to protect uh, very respected figures like Brent Scowcroft, uh, George Bush number one's uh, national security advisor, uh, uh, Gareth Evans, uh, former prime minister of Australia, head of the International Crisis Group, and other distinguished Western figures. And they considered the responsibility to protect. And uh, they concluded that uh, it must be, maybe there is a responsibility to protect, they said, but it must be restricted to the United Nations Security Council. Uh, that is, as they put it, uh, there's restrictions in the UN Charter on the use of force, uh, saying you're allowed to use force either under Security Council orders or under direct attack until the Security Council can act. And they said that should not be changed. No one else has a right to use force for a responsibility to protect. Uh, they pointed out that it would uh, simply be used as an excuse for aggression. Uh, they were actually reiterating uh, what the World Court had concluded in one of its earliest decisions, Corfu case in the late 1940s. Uh, and uh, the General Assembly shortly after uh, re strongly reaffirmed this conclusion. So yes, there might be a responsibility to protect, but it's what it always was in the hands of the Security Council. Uh, it's instantly of some interest, perhaps, that the U.S. population uh, strongly supports this view. The popular view in the United States is that the United Nations should take the lead in international crises. Uh, the U.S. should go along with them like other law-abiding states, almost exactly the opposite of policy, no matter who's in office. And that, too, is nicely silenced. Uh, these are... Uh, 
facts only, and uh, throughout history, facts have been regarded as a minor impediment to uh, establishing and promulgating uh, ideological necessities. Well, uh, these are uh, a few of the many thoughts that come to mind, at least to my mind, in uh, ruminating about uh, hostility and uh, hospitality in contemporary politics. Thank you, No, And we will have, hopefully, plenty of time for question and answer later, where you can take up uh, some of these points with our speakers. Um, our second panelist this evening is Stephen Fowle, a colleague and professor uh, of sociology here at Boston College. He has written numerous books, including Images of Deviance and Social Control, Death at the Parasite Café, Left Behind, Religion, Technology, and Flight from the Flesh. He's co-editor of a volume called Culture, Power, and History, Studies in Critical Sociology, and is author of the forthcoming Venus in Video, Cybernetics and Ultra-Modern Power. Stephen is also a past president of the Society for the Study of Social Problems, and a video maker and a performing artist. His title this evening is From Hostility to Hospitality, Reckoning with Haunted Histories of Power. Steve. I've taught in this classroom before, so I know how to play around with this a little bit. In thinking of remarks, a lot of things that Noam just was talking about you know, really resonate with me. I mean, his concern with why facts don't count. We can have all the facts we want, but they don't really, in fact, make a difference uh, within a place in an American society where I think the word you were used that ideology becomes installed uh, into us, so there's a kind of forgetfulness and inattentiveness. Um, but the, the, the crimes, you know, the massive uh, place of domination and their effects, these things don't go away just because we don't consciously recognize them. So the talk is about hauntings how really the violence of our own history surrounds us like an atmosphere, how we push it away, we're, you know, push it, keep it away, deny it, and so forth, uh, as a large collectivity, and yet it continues to come back. So what kind of methods, particularly since we're talking, we're situated this in the university, what kind of methods of knowledge, learning, and unlearning are appropriate to begin to reckon uh, with these hauntings? And that's a stage, uh, you know, truth and reconciliation. It's a stage that deal with that truth on the way towards sort of kind of reconciliation. In thinking about how to begin remarks, uh, I was just amused last week when I saw Hugo Chavez, president of Venezuela, uh, give a book to President Obama. And of course, this new style of engagement and so forth. Uh, I was also really taken uh, by the uh, tax on right-wing radio that Obama received this book. Uh, people like Michael Savage uh, heard just last night talking about, this is just the swamps of liberalism for him to accept this book, a new comrade. This is what I told you, he's a socialist. The book he gave, and of course, I, just, I make this connection to this panel. I mean, Noam Chomsky's our featured speaker. Um, Hugo Chavez recommended one of Noam Chomsky's books a couple years ago. <laughs> you know, at the UN, he recommended that everyone ought to read, you know, Hegemony or Survival, America's Quest for Global Domination. Uh, this again hit a, you know, or, or talk wing radio. Uh, Noam Chomsky's book rose up on Amazon at that time, The Complexity of Global Circulations and Stories. Uh, uh, but so did Eduardo Galeano's book, uh, became number two uh, as of Monday on Amazon, uh, the English version, Open Veins, of the uh, 1971 uh, Spanish version, La Venas Abiertas de Americana Latina, a history of the violence in the New World brought by Europe, brought by North American powers, a rather long history that Noam Chomsky has participated in amplifying. Um, both these books, uh, uh, in many ways become kind of outside a cursed text uh, for a problem of forgetting, for a culture based on forgetting, where our own memories in some sense are to keep away our reality and so forth. Uh, the work of Galliano, 
um, is a historical work, and it's unusual because much of what we know about him today is this kind of hybrid form uh, that plays with fiction, that plays with history, that plays with poetry, that tries to conjure up in a style uh, that's meant to bring power to the surface, to bring memory to the present and so forth. Um, so Memories of Fire, uh, uh, the three-volume work, I think, is what's most known uh, in English. Uh, um, but this book uh, um, that is recommended that, that Obama now has the Spanish uh, copy of, uh, The Open Veins of Latin America, uh, was written intensely in three weeks, uh, years of research, but three weeks of intensive writing. As soon as it was published, it established Galeano, in some sense, as an ethical voice uh, uh, and a major author uh, from the South, uh, uh, speaking to problems about how North-South relationships work and the violence that they beget. Um, a reviewer, a couple years after the book was published, um, writing from the point of view of more respected history, says the book really is obviously well received in Latin America, has become the voice of Latin American intellectuals. On the other hand, the book uh, doesn't have properly scholarly detachment. Uh, it, it lists facts and histories, uh, but doesn't do those with a sense of neutrality and scholarly objectivity. Uh, uh, Galliano himself responds uh, by objectivity being a haunted place of forgetfulness as well as memory uh, and how to think uh, of that forgetfulness is very much connected uh, to this sort of a call upon uh, Obama uh, to play in the swamps of uh, uh, the swamps of liberalism. Just when I heard that term swamps I can't help but thinking of Klaus Tevelite's book called Male Fantasies which is a history of really people growing up in the power atmosphere of what became National Socialism. Uh, Klaus Tevelite's father was a Nazi, was part of the Free Corps. And Tevelite, to understand Nazi power, um, tells not just the facts, but much like Galliano, tries to go to the atmosphere, uh, looks at the biographies, the writings, the fascinations, the fears of these men that became National Socialists. And the, the term swamp appears everywhere. The morass, the swamp, the liquid, the worrisome, they associate this with femininity, associate this with impurity, a demand for a pure history cleansed of memories of the actual violence those histories may beget. Edward Galliano later criticized Veins himself, so suggesting his own attempt to kind of have just an objectivity, carried the facts, but he, like Noam Chomsky just argued, facts may not be enough. The facts are there, um, but how to read them, how to let them to affect us, uh, how to actually begin uh, to recognize that the Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, begins with a project uh, uh, that's called generosity, called hospitality, uh, but maybe really nothing but hostility, and maybe the word uh, should be solved, a new kind of genocide. Um, uh, some of this talk will be uh, based on uh, work that was done here at Boston College, uh, the dissertation that became a book by Avery Gordon in the sociology department called Ghostly Matters, Haunting in the Sociological Imagination, a 1907, uh, 1997 University of Minnesota Press book, uh, where Gordon really tries to look for a methodology to come to terms with why we can't come to terms with facts, to come to terms in an embodied, uh, sometimes poetic, uh, certainly political way, uh, with why really the actual materiality of history um, often just turns into the fictions we live by. We live in a decent uh, country of freedom and democracy. Freedom is on the march, as said the arrogance of George Bush. In his work called Walking Words, um, uh, Galliano invites us to really look at, in some sense, what Manuel Castells, when he looks at the ruins of new global liberalism, uh, the new neoliberalism circulates the planet, calls the fourth world, uh, to be located not just south of the border, uh, but really uh, in every major uh, economically developed place, uh, uh, fourth world, the citizens that become marginalized, uh, always on the outside of power, but haunting power. Uh, uh, by their acts of defiance, sometimes by their terrible deeds. Uh, I'm trying to really find power in ways that don't get, aren't legitimate, that can't be there. Galliano writes in Walking Words uh, a story and asks us uh, to connect to the story of El Gato, uh, the cat, a young, ragged, unkempt, stoned, often violent, uh, a disorderly a young man, uh, uh, you know, a child really in some sense uh, of the bankruptcy of North-South relationships. Uh, uh, El Gato does not pose an easy identification uh, uh, for sympathy, for liberal, for charity, uh, but it poses a question really in some sense of the distortions, the monstrosities of power as actually enacted. Uh, maybe this is like the fourth world. Uh, uh, Galliano, uh, in some sense, uh, in his story, chastises uh, simply Christian charity reaching out to help uh, if it doesn't engage in contesting the very structures of power that lead one to need help. Uh, 
Um, uh, appeasing the desperate, he argues, is no substitution um, for a different form of transformation uh, that the Gospels, he suggests, would call us upon to transform structures, not simply to help those who are victims of them. Um, in his book on Guatemala, uh, something that Noam Chomsky has also written about, uh, Guatemala, an occupied country, uh, Galeano really quotes the voice of the Catholic priest, uh, the Mirino, uh, Father Thomas Melville. Melville says this, any capitalist system, whether it's based on lazy fear or not, is essentially based on competition, rugged individualism that separates individuals from the larger community, the profit motive. It is difficult to see how such a system, though materially successful in the global realm, can ever actually be supported by Christianity and Christian societies with their missions of love. Galliano brings us back to the story of Elgato. Um, he writes about Elgato um, joining a crowd of urchins uh, on a Christmas day where the mayor of the local town uh, distributes Christmas blessings dressing up like Santa Claus. On the balcony, open to the sun, the mayor is sweating bullets. Down below, roaring commotion in the sea of urchins, children in rag, a foam of hands raised up to the sky. Dressed like a benign Santa Claus, the mirror throws down the toys from above. A metaphor, really, of Christian charity. Maybe a metaphor of hostility um, disguising, uh, uh, the, or, you know, hostility you know, cloaked in the mask of, of generosity or hospitality. The toys rain down over the tumultuous crowd. Poor children have a right to happiness. These lucky kids dash about and flail, throwing punches and insults, stepping over one another. A life-sized doll knocks over several. A space rocket strikes right between uh, the eyes of another. Candies fall like rocks. This is a parable of despair, uh, converting toys into missiles and projectiles. A, a dark and humorous twist uh, on a war and poverty that poses itself in the form of charity, but really presents itself as a reenactment of hostility. Elgato is marginalized by the economy of exploitation and productive profit in which he really does not find a place. And yet he still identifies with it. He searches for money. Uh, he finds a dead corpse of a rich man, takes the wallet, and buys a TV, quickly connecting Ill -ill you know, illicit uh, gain to uh, consumption. Um, but with that TV, uh, and he's noticed right away for having it, it's not someone of his class should have such a TV. Um, in the story, he's escaped death squads, uh, these uh, groups that go through the night to help clean up the town, remove uh, uh, the remnants of what actually is happening, uh, keep the poor out of sight. Uh, um, he doesn't get any notice for that. He's not in the media for that. But as soon as he's found with this TV, it becomes a televisionary spectacle himself. The police and media converge and tell the story of, yes, law and order is being brought south of the border. Uh, this is the story that Galliano tells. With a number on his chest, Elgato confronts the black eye of the camera. The magnesium flash freezes him out of time. The shutter clicks, showing some history, but keeping others away. He becomes a kind of trophy for a new world order of cleaning things up. He is fully othered. The sociologist Durkheim talks about four functions of othering in his essay on the functions of crime. Um, the first form of othering allows us to create social boundaries that keep the clean from the, you know, the unclean, that keep the pure from the impure. The second develops a kind of group solidarity. In this country, we call it patriotism. The third is a kind of uh, scapegoating energy that distracts you from what haunts you, that keeps you from what makes you nervous, uh, um, that in some sense relaxes you. Um, this is also a function of the policing of the boundaries, the keeping of the other out there. But Durkheim also suggests that working on the boundaries of the dynamic project, uh, this tension between the inside and the outside, uh, uh, the group that's in privilege and those who are othered, uh, um, is a constant project. It has to be renewed, and it creates a place for openness, a you know, place for possible transformation, a different future than just reproducing the self-same. But that place has to be contested. Uh, what kind of knowledges do we pass on to our students that allow those border places to be contested? that allows the actual facts of domination uh, to be reckoned with as opposed to just be pushed aside. That's not the American way. Thinking about power in several different ways, um, you know, this, this haunted histories of power. Um, I certainly, you know, so I don't want to think of power as just one dimension, that it's only domination, it couldn't be other things. Uh, 
Um, you know, with the psychologist Rollo May, I think of power as something that's a constitutive feature of, of humans. We do need certain kind of boundaries. It isn't that there can always be fluidity and so forth. Uh, we need some ways of reckoning with environments. Uh, um, but is that a one-way reckoning where what is cast into the environment, cast to the outside, is constantly dominated? Uh, can there be a form of dialogue between? Um, the sociologist Max Weber offers social science's most well-known definition of power. It's the ability for those who have it to resist, you know, even the hauntings, the, the resistances, the challenges of those who don't. Uh, um, it's useful to think about, uh, but I think more complex is the notion of power that operates something like a field that we're all in. It isn't that you have it and don't have it. Uh, and this, I think, is one of the gifts of Michel Foucault, to think of power as an atmosphere, a material force field in which we're all situated, uh, uh, maneuvering, uh, um, trying to find uh, places of memory and uh, staged in some ways by places of forgetting. Um, so I want to think of this, you know, place of power as something that we're in. We're complicit with it. Um, it isn't really just that some bad people have it and we don't. Um, how to reckon with our own place within a field of power and our own complicities and wondering about how to challenge those and change those complicities. Um, and, uh, you know, and uh, when you think of power, I also want to think of, of it sometimes just as forceful as the torture that the U.S. You know, from 1953 uh, enforces, uh, gives, provides assistance, techniques, aids, finances for in Iran um, until that uh, is thrown over. Uh, you know, by the, by the revolution that threw out uh, the Shah and his American cronies. Uh, but also to think of power in a more, you know, complex way. Noam Chomsky writes earlier in his career about the manufacturing of consent. Hegemonic power is also winning uh, um, our, our consent, literally, uh, uh, or seducing us into some memories and keeping us away from all that stuff that makes our memories uneasy. Um, uh, the memories, for instance, of what's the actual history uh, of our relationship to a colonized territory, American native peoples and the like. Uh, um, you know, with the election of Obama, uh, maybe not just stylistically, I hope substantively, collectively we begin to deal with the legacies of, you know, what the U.S. and uh, or what you know, transatlantic slave trade did to Africa and to how Africans ended up and how African Americans have a genealogy, you know, literally of uh, having been enslaved and turned disenfranchised into a market. Uh, uh, but much less present to most of our memories is what happens uh, uh, with American Native peoples who continue to exist. Uh, and I know PBS is now having a series on Monday nights that begins to try to stage this in some documentary ways with the voices uh, of American Indian, American Native, Indigenous peoples uh, uh, guiding the narrative. Uh, um, so I think it's important to think of one other dimension of power that haunts us, and this is what the Peruvian sociologist uh, Anibal Quijano calls uh, the coloniality of power. Um, that when we think of racism, or even when we think of, you know, how gender is organized, uh, think of the complex webs of how gender and class and race and nation state all organize themselves, all these things marked uh, continuously by 500 years of colonial power. Um, so the distortions, the warps, the fascinations and fears, uh, the exoticization as well as the just locking out of others and so forth. Uh, all these things need to be part of our grappling uh, and be part of our, in some sense, reckonings. Uh, uh, and I think our, our projects as teachers across fields uh, need to reckon with the scopes of power that haunt everything from the chemistry lab and the decisions are made here, the sociology and the theology classrooms, or to the art. What kind of art is imaginable and what kind of arts aren't imaginable? I mean, what kind of things would just seem to us as, as ugly or discordant and so forth and how to, how to think rigorously about these kind of things? What forms of knowledge uh, can transform? Um, Galliano himself looks backwards in time, uh, someone who honors history as a place that when it's connected to the present opens up new futures. Honors history as a place in the present that when it's uh, uh, possible opens up new futures. And one of the histories he goes back to are the histories of the whole continent, both continent, North and South First Nations. Um, Marx and Engels, of course, viewed indigenous peoples as the model for what they called a primitive communism. Uh, common property, communion with non-human as well as human beings, uh, communion with the planet, uh, uh, with the earth that was envisioned as a mother an energetic materiality, uh, ceremonies that were in some sense matrifocal and guided by gratitude for the earth as a hospital living mother, rather than the earth is hostile and constantly need of our mastery. Um, I grew up in Syracuse, New York. Uh, I'm complicit with these stories I'm telling. As a young boy, 
Uh, my family used to go out to the Iroquois uh, Onondaga Reservation, and I would dress up right out of popular culture. Maybe this is ideology installed into my body, using Noam Chomsky's terms. I would dress up as Davy Crockett. I would get the rifle. My family would go to get the cheap apples. And I knew that it was a dangerous mission to get those apples. I was involved in television. So I would have my gun ready. What possibly uh, would the Onondaga people think of me? And what did I imagine as them? Not the victims of our own genocidal practices, but somehow savages. And I needed to keep my little you know, uh, middle class family away from. Uh, these are haunting things. Uh, to be worried about those things don't seem rational, but this is how, in some sense, our history plays itself out. Not just facts, but embodied sensibilities, aesthetics, uh, uh, strange moral twists, upside down reversals, and so forth. Uh, uh, stuff that's all about emotion and body as well as cognition. So I'm really interested in us playing with knowledge in a complex way, uh, particularly recognized in all the forms of knowledge we have are sacrificial a term drawn, I suppose, from religion, but to really think that once we have some form of framework, other things are left aside. Are they temporarily forgotten? Are they deeply repressed? Are, are they you know, something you can't talk about uh, for fear of not being polite, not being patriotic, or just not being able to pass in public? You know, how do we change these kind of things? Um, again, Galliano uh, returns to the question of, of those in a book called We Say No. Uh, returns to the question of this other side. Uh, an other side, he said, first name, first time done in the name of Christianity, the mixture of crown, cross, and sword. And we honor the cross and crown at Boston College. Uh, um, are we haunted that the sword went along with those things? Should we be? How can we be? I mean, how can we be? How can we reckon with the actual histories that we're participating in? Um, he writes this. After five centuries of business from all versions of Christianity, one-third of the American forest has been annihilated. A lot of once fertile land is sterile. Half the population eats infrequently. The Indians, victims of the greatest thievery in world history, still suffer usurpation of the remaining bits of land and are still condemned to the negation of their own identity as something primitive, savage, outside real conversation with modernity. They're still prohibited from living traditional ways, their right to be themselves is still denied. At first, pillage and other side were carried out in the name of God. Now they're carried out in the name of neoliberal progress. Sometimes this is preemptive warfare. What other forms of knowledge, again, are possible? You know, I'm going to close with some meditations first on Avery Gordon's book, uh, 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 Hauntings in the Sociological Imagination, Ghostly Matters, and then return to one final place from Galliano. Gordon invites us to really take seriously, uh, as social scientists, as uh, people in the humanities, in the arts, uh, the project of ghost uh, um, and the project of haunting. Um, she says this, haunting is a constitutive element of Western modernity. It is neither pre-modern superstition nor an individual form of psychosis. It is a generalizable social phenomena of great importance. To study one's uh, social life today, one must confront what haunts spheres of power. Ghosts operate on that field, distorting knowledge, not making it possible to confront certain kind of facts. In haunting, organized forces and systemic structures that appear removed from us make their impact felt in everyday life in ways that confound our analytic separations, things we try to keep away from. They seep into and cross the borders. She describes the presence of ghosts in this way as a seething presence, remnants of power and power acts that we forget. Um, she also calls these kind of uncomforts that we experienced around the edges of what we know and what we forget uh, as really signs of a kind of empirical evidence that Kantian is taking place. Um, she urges us to make contact with the ghosts, to reckon with our actual material histories, but cautions us again that just knowledge of the facts may not be enough. We need, I think, what the, um, she calls her, uh, the subtitle of her book, A Haunting the Sociological Imagination, C. Wright Mills, in the book The Sociological Imagination, 1959, calls for a mixture of you know, critical biographical analysis in our social structural position history that place between. He said, it isn't enough just to get factual information about that place. We need a new sensibility that will allow us without guilt 
to reckon with the consequences of the enormous violence that we should take be accountable for, begin to be responsible for. Now, how do we do that without just feeling guilt, without feeling paranoia? I mean, this is something I think that is, is the challenge for us uh, out of this whole seminar series, perhaps. Uh, how do we begin uh, to give hospitality? First, I think we have to deal with the hostilities that have been our own. Um, and those are difficult things to reckon with. Uh, um, I think we're going to have to sacrifice some of our privileges, certainly sacrifice some of what we think of as our just uh, cleaned up self-image, uh, uh, change that image. Uh, um, the work I, I usually advocate in this regard is something like a power reflexive uh, form of engagement uh, uh, with these hauntings. Uh, a power reflexivity deals with resonances as well as facts. Uh, um, that really, in some sense, is about an embodied, uh, uh, taking seriously emotion and embodiment, uh, taking seriously sacrifices and hauntings uh, uh, that bring us to a crossroads where, in some sense, uh, um, you know, we're asked, uh, uh, again, literally, uh, to reckon with uh, uh, that which we've done uh, before we can reconcile with uh, others who we have, in some sense, pushed to the outside. Uh, this sometimes happens at the very edge of semiotic uh, availability, uh, things that we don't have good words for, we don't have clean lessons or good programs for, because we have a whole history of just doing the opposite, of denying, uh, repressing, and keeping away. Reckoning, Gordon writes, is about knowing what kind of effort becomes required uh, to make the conditions we're in different, uh, um, how to attend to what is acceptable as well as unacceptable, but not just to notice limits, but begin to do what she calls uh, the work of uh, uh, Walter Benjamin, the profane illumination, uh, to spark up uh, with some courage, to spark up what's on the outside of us uh, uh, that we engage it. Uh, uh, in my own teaching is, is to teach things like what Noam Chomsky is doing. I know I've used his book, so to teach the facts of history, but also ask the students to engage in a project of disautobiography. Not tell their own story, but tell the story you can't tell unless you reckon with structures of power that usually are kept away from us. So how to do disautobiographical analysis. Uh, also, of course, as a sociology, ask students to you know, be in contact uh, uh, with cultures, practices, social classes that otherwise they wouldn't be in contact with here at Chestnut Hill. Um, so how to have contact with those who have been othered uh, and how to have methods that are attentive in some sense to not only what the cognitive but the emotional elements of knowledge that might come from this. In We Say No, Galliano conjures up an image of a kind of animistic blue tiger. By animism, he's talking about those fields of forces that are not humans alone, that humans participate in. Some of those are forces that have to do with the living energetic nature. Some of those are forces that have to do with histories that just aren't, have, have not been you know, embodied, histories that have not been claimed. Um, and uh, animism is also an interesting image that Gordon uses uh, to talk about this, this field of reckoning with haunting because it draws you out of yourself into something that's quite alive, um, that actually beckons you, but you don't know what it is until you begin this reckoning. Uh, Galliano writes this. But to hear the voice of the blue tiger, and he creates this kind of fictional, natural, historical creature that lies below the hammock of the first father and mother at rest. To hear that voice is to be situated not simply in a form of therapy, like a new age relaxation, really getting into myth, really enjoying yourself and finding yourself in a kind of personal consciousness, enlightenment and so forth, but quite the opposite. It's to be confronted by a moment of historical crisis the crisis of really forgetting what you are part of in history. Um, Galileano says, though, however, our collective memory remains stubbornly alive. A thousand times it's reborn in the hiding places uh, where that blue tiger licks your womb. How, or how to come in contact with that wound, um, wounds that we have everything to do with. Uh, in, a, in a work called Traditions of the Future, he writes this. There is just one place where yesterday's hostilities and today's hope uh, can meet each other, and that's to recognize and embrace each other, but that place is tomorrow. How can we possibly prepare for it? That's what I'm beginning to think about. He asked us to return to the ancient voice of indigenous peoples, um, to learn a first lesson, and that's the lesson of community. The ancient voice that speaks to us of people that still remain, heralds another world, community, the communal mode of production in life. It's the oldest of the American traditions, but a tradition that's left aside uh, when capitalism enters this land like smallpox, like the flu. It came from abroad. It was not part of the indigenous scene. He ends, and I'll end this way, with somewhat of a poetic meditation. Sometimes his work seems magical. It's certainly deeply political. It's always about history. 
but it's about resonances and hauntings that I think are really uh, everything to do with begin to confront uh, uh, ghosts for the purpose of social justice, not for the purpose of entertainment. That's what, you know, we have ghosts all over the Hollywood screen. So how do we really confront ghosts, the actual ghosts that we live with? Um, if we were to do that, he suggests our intuitive imagination of a future begins to open up, an imagination that isn't even possible for us if we're locked into a present of forgetfulness. There the ear shall be cleansed of all passions for domination, of all passions for accumulation and private property, all passions for empire. Left alone will be the passions of human and energetic world. In the streets, cars will be run over by dogs. Economists will refuse and will never be able to measure living standards any longer by consumption levels or the quality of life by the quantity of things possessed. Politicians shall not believe that the poor actually like to eat promises. Food shall not be a commodity, nor shall communications be a big business, because both food and communication should be human rights. No one shall die of hunger, because no one will be overeating, no one will be overdeveloped. We shall be compatriots and contemporaries of all who have a yearning for justice and beauty, no matter where they were born or where they lived, because the borders of geopolitical time and space shall cease to exist. What will exist is what we have in conversation together. Hear the haunting other, uh, the ghostly stranger, the exiled alien, comes into dialogue with those of us haunted at the center of what we might as well call a kind of empire, an empire of forgetfulness. Here is the possibility for hostility to be transformed into something approaching hospitality. Thank you. You know, Foucault's notion of um, the, you know, fields of power roll from domination to domination. You know, I, I do believe that, you know, every formation of social life and social power is to some degree exclusionary. I mean, you know, Foucault is kind of working with a Nietzschean text, you know, that, that the fields of force, you know, create, I think, a, a will to power, a field of power, and there's some kind of exclusions. Um, and yet, on the other hand, I think he dreams of something like a limit experience that would, you know, why his use of genealogy, that would in some ways be able to show how those borders are constructed, but also in some ways point toward what isn't there in the borders and, you know, be able to haunt us with that regard. I mean, Foucault, although it, some people read him as a cynical theorist of power, uh, in many ways, you know, evoked kind of, you know, utopian feelings of, of not, not, you know, not in the way that Galliano did, that the world now will be in, in a kind of harmonic place, that he goes backwards in time and, you know, and re-mythologizes a, a place of, like, primitive communism, but that we, in some sense, could have a, a form of, of political practice that would be, you know, vigilant about its exclusions. And, you know, to me, this is the grace of something like Foucault and his really kind of reckoning with this question of limit experience, which is like dealing with hauntings. Now, how do you do with that? You know, how do you, in some sense, defamiliarize what we've become hegemonically embodied as? And, and like, what kind of strategies do we have to begin to open that up? So if Keith, you know, so in that sense, you know, Keith Oberman wouldn't be any better at Bill O'Reilly, except if... And he recognized what he's talking about is always historically situated, provisional, and will have limits. You know, and, you know, it is, so it's not some just this is the final answer. This is, you know, dangers like final solutions that you again start to totalize. So, I, so how, how to have this kind of ongoing vigilance? You know, recognize that yet you do need boundaries, and boundaries do involve, you know, othering. But how do you then fold those back upon each other so the gathering isn't structurally permanent? Thank you. Noam, do you want to say a word about that? Well, if I under, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I understood you and I heard part of it, but if you're saying that we should try to approach these questions from a point of view that's beyond ideology, is that, yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. I mean, there is a world out there and there are facts about that world and we can look at them, uh, you know, we're never, we can't get out of our skins and we recognize we can't get out of our skin, so element of self-criticism, but I think you can look at facts, simple facts, pretty realistically. I mean, I concede that I'm kind of simple-minded about these things. It doesn't seem to me fundamentally different than studying the sciences. <laughs>
where you also can't get out of your skin and you're self-critical and you're you know, willing to accept uh, that maybe you're on the wrong track. But I don't see anything particularly ideological about, for example, the, uh, the meaning of the great seal of the uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, or about the whole notion of humanitarian intervention, which is a leading principle of Western intellectuals and which is a total fraud. I don't think that that's left or right or anything else. It just seems to me you know, that the South is correct when they say it's just a, it, it's simply a, and the world court is correct when they say it's just a mask for a, a traditional aggression. If we can investigate that, you know, we can look at the history, see what actually happened and so on. And yes, it's uh, not free from uh, a point of view and a perspective and a level of understanding that can be submitted to self-criticism, but it doesn't seem to me like a particularly complex uh, enterprise. You, uh, Ali? Uh, yes. Um, so I heard the panel thinks about um, how the war on drugs can be shaped the world, particularly in South America, Latin America, and Afghanistan. Oh, the war of drugs. What's the future of that? How will it shape the war of drugs? Well, let, let's take a look at the war of dr on drugs, right? I mean, it's been declared probably 20 times in the last uh, 20 years or so. Every couple of years it's declared. Uh, it's declared against a background of understanding. Uh, for example, it was studied years ago by the RAND Corporation, the main government advisory corporation, and the Army, in which they investigated uh, just straight cost-benefit analysis of various ways of treating the drug problem. Drug problem's here, it's not in Colombia. Uh, so uh, they said, well, you know, which ways of dealing with the problem here are cost effective? And they found, uh, which will surprise no one who's paid attention to the history, that the most cost effective way of doing it uh, is prevention and treatment. Okay? In fact, if you think about it, that's the way one of the worst drug problems has been handled. I mean, there is a drug which is much worse than cocaine. It's called tobacco. It kills far more people uh, than uh, cocaine does. And it was handled pretty well by uh, cultural change. So if you look through the 1980s, it's a class issue. So people <coughs> with education and you know, degree of privilege uh, simply adopted a, a, a more healthy lifestyle. Uh, they stopped smoking, they stopped eating red meat, uh, they didn't drink as much coffee, and so on. There were no police, you know, the, no, nobody uh, uh, carried out chemical warfare in uh, North Carolina and uh, Kentucky to destroy tobacco fields. Uh, they, it was simply an educational process, a kind of cultural change that led to a significant decline of the use of by far the most dangerous drug uh, among people who were uh, a part of that uh, cultural change that took place thanks to their privilege. Okay, now that's exactly what the RAND and the Army study years ago. Uh, they were, of course, discussing tobacco, but that's exactly what they concluded about um, hard drugs and, or marijuana. They said the best, the cheapest, and the most effective way of dealing with it is prevention and treatment. Well, there's another way, uh, use of police. Okay, that's much less effective and much more costly. Uh, there's a third way, uh, interdiction at the borders. That's still more expensive by quite a large margin and far less of, uh, uh, and f uh, far more costly. And the worst way of all, you know, way more costly than anything else and the totally ineffective, is uh, uh, what we call fumigation, but what in fact is chemical warfare. Uh, I've been down to southern Colombia and seen some of it. It's chemical warfare which is driving uh, huge numbers of peasants off their land, destroying their crops. Uh, Colombia has the second biggest refugee problem in the world after Sudan. Uh, and they're driven into urban slums and multinational corporations come in and start mining and so on and so forth. That's the least effective and the uh, uh, most costly. And you know the fact that we do it, again, if you can kind of abstract yourself and pretend you're a Martian looking at this, is just kind of unimaginable. I mean, the number of people in Colombia killed by U.S. tobacco is way beyond the number of Americans killed by Colombian cocaine. 
Maybe you go to a country like China, it's astronomically more. Okay, do they have a right to come to the United States and uh, carry out chemical warfare in uh, North Carolina and Kentucky because uh, uh, they have a tobacco problem and it's coming from here? Yeah, I mean, you can't even speak the words. It's so outlandish. Uh, but we do it and we think it's just fine. You know? Even though it's known to be the least effective, uh, the most costly, uh, and totally immoral, as we see right away if we think of the situation reversed. Well, that's been going on for decades. That's the war on drugs. Uh, the use it hasn't affected the use of drugs here at all. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, just take a look at the cost of drugs and availability, barely changed. Well, you know, when people carry out a so-called war for years and years, uh, when they know what the consequences are going to be, and they have plenty of evidence that that's exactly what the consequences are, and it has no effect on drugs, a, a rational person will begin to ask themselves, is this a war on drugs? Okay, I mean, are they totally insane? No. Uh, is it a war on drugs? Or is it a war to, uh, uh, in Colombia, for example, a part of a war of counterinsurgency? Uh, to clear peasants off the land so that uh, multinational corporate mining corporations and agribusiness can come in and so on. And in the United States, is it a war on drugs or is it an effort to get rid of uh, what are called the dangerous classes? Uh, people, if you look at the history of prohibition, there's good work in legal history on the history of prohibition. It's very typically aimed at what are called the dangerous classes. Uh, people who are kind of getting in our hair. So what we call prohibition, you know, uh, uh, banning of alcohol, uh, wasn't aimed at uh, wealthy people in Westchester County, New York, uh, and so on. They could do whatever they liked. But it was aimed at working class people and uh, uh, immigrants and, uh, you know, the, the bars in downtown Manhattan. Uh, uh, marijuana, if you look at the prohibition of marijuana, it was not on medical grounds. It was because it was used by Mexicans. Uh, and then it was used in the 1920s by blacks in the Harlem Renaissance. And then, of course, in the 1930s, the Bureau of uh, Narcotics had a big problem. Prohibition came in, and they had this huge apparatus, and what are they going to do with it? So they had to find something, so, okay, I figure we'll go after marijuana. But the drug of the dangerous classes, and if, you kind of, if you look at the whole, in fact, this goes back to the 19th century. I mean, in 19th century England, uh, gin was... Uh, prohibited, but whiskey wasn't. Well, just take a look at who was drinking them. Uh, and that runs right through history. These are wars to control the dangerous classes. Uh, in fact, the explosion of the war on drugs here was in the 1980s and since. And during that period, uh, uh, the U.S. incarceration programs just flew off the spectrum. I mean, back around 1980, uh, the U.S. was sort of slightly at the high end of industrial societies and per capita incarceration, but within the spectrum. And now it's five to ten times as high as uh, comparable countries, and not because there's more crime. In fact, crimes remain kind of steady, and it's still relative to other countries what it was. Uh, and if you take a look at who's in jail, yeah, the, pe the useless people, the black males, uh, people who we can't incorporate in our society. This is the residue of slavery, of course. They don't have different genes. Uh, so, yeah, they're the ones we get rid of. Uh, and in Latin America, there's a name for it. It's called social cleansing. Uh, the dangerous classes, you send out the death squads and, you know, kill them and leave them under the bridge. We're more humane here, so you put them in jail forever. Uh, and uh, the, pr the imprisonment, uh, uh, the it's not just the level of incarceration, but the savagery of it is just unknown in comparable countries. I mean, like Amnesty International did a study a couple of years ago of uh, children in prison without chance of parole, so permanently, permanent uh, imprisonment. I don't remember the exact numbers, but you know, they, they didn't deal with countries that don't have statistics, you know, like uh, Sudan. But in the countries where you know something about what's going on, I think they found something like maybe 2,500 cases and about 2,400 were in the United States. I mean, this includes cases of, you know, 12-year-old kid who happened to be in a room where a, a felony murder was carried out. Okay, he's in jail for life. Well, actually, I've seen cases like this in prison, which are, well, I'll tell you one case, just I don't know how prevalent it is. But during the civil rights years, 
I was down in Jackson, Mississippi for, for demonstration, and uh, I was with Howard's Inn and a couple other people from up here, and we designated ourselves uh, with proper self-congratulation as a New England professor's delegation. <laughs> so we were escorted through the prison by the police chief and that sort of thing. And uh, in the prison, Jackson, Mississippi prison, which is not bad by usual standards, I've been locked up myself in worse prisons. But uh, as we w were walking down the halls, uh, we passed one of these huge cages, you know, people in the cages, and uh, they were all black, uh, black men. But as we walked past, uh, a child uh, tapped on the bars and asked, happened to be standing here, he asked me if I could get him a drink of water. So I turned to the police chief and I said, can I get him a drink of water? There's a fountain down the hall. So he said, sure. So he came over and gave him a drink of water. Well, when we got back to the office to talk to the chief, I, we asked him, well, what's that kid doing in there? So he asked some clerk to look it up. And it turned out that they just found him in the streets. And they didn't know what to do with him. And so they put him in jail. And he'll stay there for the rest of his life. Now, cases like that are not counted. you know, But they, they're just part of the savagery of imprisonment of the dangerous classes. And most of the, you know, a very high percentage of the people in uh, prison are uh, drug-related offenses. So you find a kid in Roxbury with a joint in his pocket, you know, happens three times, okay, he's in jail for who knows how many years. It has nothing to do with reducing drugs. You can see that from the statistics. But it does have something to do with purifying the society of the people who we find threatening the dangerous classes, usually people were crushing in one form or another. I don't see any other rational interpretation of the so-called war on drugs. Thank you. Petra. Well, actually, the bombing of, I mean, there's a connection, of course, between the Balkan Wars of the early 90s and the bombing of Serbia in 1999, but not, not a direct connection. Uh, with regard to the disintegration of Yugoslavia, actually, the U.S. role was not honorable, but it wasn't the worst. Uh, as uh, the U.S., in fact, was in favor of uh, maintaining the uh, integrity of the former Yugoslavia, as incidentally were most people in the country in polls at that time. Uh, but it started to split off. The first one to split off was Slovenia. Okay, that was not a big problem. Slovenia is pretty much part of the West anyway, so a small conflict, but nothing much. The next one to split off was Croatia, and that was a big issue because I think about a third of the population of Croatia is Serbian, and this was then part of Yugoslavia. So when Croatia pulled out, uh, the Yugoslav army uh, entered to try to protect the integrity of the country and the Serbian minority. Well, at that point, the main villain was Germany. The Germans' initiative, they, Germany wanted to restore a traditional relationship with Croatia, which is not very pretty, if you happen to remember the Second World War. Uh, but uh, they wanted to restore that and you know, kind of reestablish their position of influence in the Balkans. So they strongly supported Croatian separation without any rights for the Serbian minority, nothing. Uh, and uh, they brought the European Union along with them. And so it continued. Uh, Clinton more or less picked up uh, the, the Muslim, the Bosniaks, so-called the Muslim population of Bosnia, I suspect, because uh, they just wanted to have a horse in the race. I mean, everybody had their friends, we're gonna pick that one. Uh, there was a chance for a political settlement in 1992, the Vance Owen plan. Uh, Clinton pressured Izzet Gabovic, the head of the, the Muslim community in Bosnia, to reject it. Now that was a guarantee of a major war, you know, just a guarantee. And after that came a major war, maybe 100,000 people killed, uh, maybe 70,000 of them Bosniaks. 
Uh, finally, there was a settlement, which is not very different from the Vance Owen plan, uh, but it was a settlement that was carried out at U.S. initiative, the Dayton plan. And uh, so the U.S. ends up with a substantial uh, degree of influence and control there. Well, that's <coughs> 1995. Uh, so Serbia was still a problem. And the reason why Serbia was a problem is, in fact, described in uh, important doc documents that are known but not discussed. Uh, the, uh, there's an important book by uh, John Norris. He's a high official in the State Department. Uh, his, uh, his superior, immediate superior, was Strobe Talbot, who was the uh, Under Secretary of State for East European Affairs, so the top guy in the Clinton administration dealing with this region. Uh, Strobe Talbot, in his introduction to the book, says, uh, uh, John Norris's book is based, this is about the Kosovo, Kosovo. He says, this book is based on Norris's complete familiarity with all relevant documents. And if you want to understand the thinking at the highest level of the Clinton administration, this is the book you have to read. Well, what does John Norris say? You take a look. He says, uh, the bombing of Serbia was not undertaken uh, out of concern for the plight of the Kosovo Albanians, which incidentally we know from masses of documentation about what was going on. He said it was because Serbia was not undertaking the required uh, social and economic reforms. It was kind of a euphemism to say, for saying it's the last holdout in Europe to our neoliberal designs. Okay, according to Strobe Talbot, that represents the highest uh, level of thinking in the Clinton administration. Well, I've quoted it a couple of times, and people have asked to Talbot and Horace about it, and they passionately reject this description. They say, oh, no, that's not what we thought at all. Well, you know, I don't read their minds. That's what they wrote. Okay, so you can make your own judgments. Uh, it's all on paper. You know, don't take my word for it. Read it. Uh, and uh, I suspect that that's pretty close to the reason for the bombing of Serbia. They're just not, it's like other, it's, uh, another reason for believing is it's characteristic of the whole, just about the whole of uh, modern international relations and for, you know, with other countries when they were Britain, when they were the dominant world power. You do not tolerate disobedience. Disobedience is dangerous. It, first of all, you don't want it in the first place, but secondly, if somebody's disobedient, somebody else will get the idea and they'll be disobedient too. That's the virus contagion theory. Uh, and uh, it just runs through the whole of uh, great power politics. Since the Second World War, that means mostly the United States because the US has been so dominant, but the same with other powers. And in fact, it, I, it's, I think it represents, I said before that I'm kind of simple-minded, and I think with all the fancy talk in international relations theory, there's only one principle that I know of that seems to me to have any merit, and that's the mafia principle. Uh, international relations is very much like the mafia. Uh, the godfather <coughs> does not accept disobedience. And for, you know, like if a small store, it doesn't, doesn't matter if it's an important country or not. So suppose some small storekeeper uh, doesn't pay his protection money well, the godfather doesn't just send out his goons to pick up the money. He sends out the coons, goons to beat them to a pulp so that others will understand that disobedience is not acceptable. Uh, and we have a rich documentary record. I mentioned a little of it, but there's plenty more uh, to show that that's been a guiding principle uh, of great power politics um, any, anywhere you look. And it's an understandable principle. Of course, there's a task of intellectuals and that's to write editorials like the one I quoted in the Boston Globe, which is universal. I don't want to dump on them. Uh, our noble efforts uh, aren't working, so let's try something else. Uh, but if you look at the record, you know, it's the mafia principle. Successful defiance, you know, the threat of a good example. You've got to, got to punish the population. Uh, and uh, I think that's probably what's involved in Serbia, with regard to Serbia. And in fact, as Serbia moves towards you know, accepting correct social and economic reforms, as they're called, uh, they'll be admitted into polite society. I mean, there's a residue of uh, antagonism because of the whole uh, you know, huge uh, outburst of uh, emotion uh, stirred up by the educated classes, but uh, I suppose it'll go, go in that direction. <laughs>
There are a lot of people trying to get in. All right. Uh, you were trying to get in from the beginning, and then the gentleman back in the white shirt. And uh, maybe you could take them in tandem, actually, because we don't have an awful lot of time left, and I want to let as many people in as possible. So if you ask your question, and you could ask yours, and then we maybe get quick responses. So my question to the panel is that uh, there seems to be this idea that humanitarianism is just the Western and U.S. way of kind of promoting their own agenda. The Bush doctrine credited in what, I mean, we have to tend to Afghanistan and Iraq to see that President Bush's foreign policy is not the best. And then now we have President Obama, who has extended from his inaugural speech to the G20, he has extended a very warm welcome to the Middle East, um, to our Arab nations, call them our allies. Then you have Iran President Ahmadinejad, pretty much, you know, not really responding as friendly as we have. So then what should we do abroad? You know, we are being criticized, we care about image abroad, but then we don't also want to be um, as, as aggressive as we've been in the past. So how should we go about dealing with other nations while maintaining um, our security, which is our most primary concern? Yeah. Okay. And just before, can no, I just sure. let this question into Norm and then, yeah. That's precisely. Just take a look back at you can read it if you like. It's uh, uh, well, shall I just? <coughs> yeah. Oh, let me mention that since we're on it. Uh, I, I was quoting in part from the internal CIA record about successful defiance. We can't tolerate it. But uh, in part, I was just quoting Arthur Schlesinger's uh, report to the incoming president, to President Kennedy, when he was coming in. He had a he, he was going to turn U.S. policy towards Latin America. So he established a Latin American mission, and Arthur Schlesinger, a very distinguished historian, was the head of the mission, and he presented the report. And his basic conclusion was what I quoted. He said, there's a serious th the Castro threat that the Castro idea of taking affairs into your own hands uh, might <coughs> spread to other countries. Uh, and it might appeal to the other countries where People are living with the same conditions of impoverishment and repression, and you know they might get the idea of taking affairs into their own hands. And if this works, you know, we're going to be in trouble because the whole system of control will evaporate. And this is absolutely standard. Like right at the same time, uh, Kennedy invaded South Vietnam. Now that's not part of our official history, but it's part of actual history. Around the same time as this, Kennedy sent the U.S. Air Force to start bombing <laughs> South Vietnam, uh, started using uh, chemical warfare to destroy foods and uh, uh, the ground cover, uh, and started rounding up what turned out to be millions of people into more or less concentration camps called strategic hamlets to protect them from the guerrillas who the U.S. knew perfectly well they were willingly supporting. Okay, that we call an invasion if somebody else does it. We call it, come here and help us when we do it. Uh, but, uh, and this was at the same time, and it was for essentially the same reasons. I and mean, we have internal documents, you know, they were thinking along the same lines. They said if Vietnam moves towards independence uh, and is successful, it will uh, be a virus spreading contagion to others. And it might spread to Thailand, it might even spread to Indonesia which is important, you know, rich resources and so on. Uh, and then, you know, the whole system, our whole system of uh, dominating uh, um, Southeast Asia may erode. It may even lead to the fall of what uh, John Dower, a leading Asian historian, uh, called the super domino Japan. The super domino Japan might accommodate to a independent East Asia becoming its technological center think back a little, that would have meant that the U.S. would have lost World War II in the Pacific, which was fought largely to prevent that. And they weren't ready to lose World War II in 1960, 61. So the U.S. did what you're supposed to do when you have a virus that's spreading contagion. You destroy the virus and you immunize those who are, you know, those who are, might be uh, affected by the contagion. So Vietnam was destroyed, no virus. Uh, and the surrounding countries were protected by installing vicious, brutal dictatorships, which controlled the population and prevented infection. In fact, in retrospect, uh, McGeorge Bundy, who was the 
one of the top advisors for Kennedy and then Johnson, he said, we probably should have stopped the war in 1965. Because in 1965, uh, General Suharto carried out a military coup in Indonesia in which they killed, you know, who knows, maybe a million people, most of them landless peasants, destroyed any possible uh, independent force, political force, and uh, opened up the country completely to Western exploitation. So that domino was safe. They were not going to be infected. And that was the big one. The others didn't matter so much, and the virus had already been dis destroyed, probably should have stopped then. Okay, that's pretty much the same thinking as Cuba, and as I mentioned, it extends all over the place. Uh, so uh, those were the reasons. And if you can read about it, it's like the Schlesinger document, you can find it on the internet if you want. Like if you want a footnote reference, I have it in when I wrote about it. Uh, for the other question was, well, how do we deal with other countries that don't respond to our gestures of generosity? Well, first of all, we should ask what the gestures look like from their point of view. Okay, they have a point of view. So for example, Ahmadinejad is kind of like a loose cannon, but he doesn't have any foreign policy influence and control. You can talk about this better than I can, but he uh, you know, deals with local affairs. You know, the person in charge is the uh, uh, supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, and his response to Obama's gesture was, well, we'd like to see some, something concrete. Uh, and as I said, they have a history. We don't. Our history of U.S.-Iran relations has one event in it, namely the takeover of the embassy. Their history of U.S.-Iran relations is much richer. I mentioned some of it. Uh, and uh, they look at affairs from the point of view of the actual history, not our particular selected event. Uh, and uh, they listened to Obama, and I presume their reaction was pretty much the same as mine was. Uh, as I mentioned, here we have maybe you know, the most violent power in the hemisphere, which spends about as much on arms as the rest of the world combined, which invaded and occupied two countries on Iran's borders. Uh, they live with that. Uh, they have a tiny military, like I said, size expenditures about like Kuwait, which is a tiny little country, uh, and haven't invaded anybody, you know, I don't know for how long, centuries, I suppose. Uh, how, how would they look at this? In fact, how should we look at it? Is that a real gesture of uh, hospitality? Well, okay, the way we could deal with it is, I, I, I have a feeling of how we should deal with it. I mean, it happens on this matter as on many. I, pretty conservative. I think we should take into account U.S. public opinion. Okay? But what's U.S. public opinion? Uh, the, uh, by a large majority in the United States, like about 75 percent, uh, the United uh, po the population here agrees with most of the countries in the world, the non-aligned countries, whose voice is not allowed to be heard, but that's most of the world. Uh, their position is that uh, Iran has, and they forcefully repeated it over and over, that Iran has the rights of any signer of the non-proliferation treaty. It, it has the right to uh, develop nuclear energy, but not nuclear weapons. Uh, so they can enrich uranium, but not for nuclear weapons. Uh, the large majority of the population here goes much farther and uh, says that uh, we should there should be established a nuclear weapons-free zone in the region which would include Israel, Iran, and any U.S. forces deployed there. Okay, uh, Same with the non-aligned countries. They say the same thing. And I think that makes a lot of sense, too. Uh, uh, these would be, re and of course, uh, and as I may have mentioned, the same large majority thinks we should end any threats against Iran. Now remember, Obama maintains the threats. That's what it means to say all options are on the table includes nuclear bombing or whatever we feel like. Okay, I think the position of the population here is pretty sound. Uh, these polls that I'm reporting from the leading polling organization in the world about two years ago, uh, they also po polled Iranian opinion. And it turns out that Iranians and Americans almost completely agree on these things. Uh, and the, when the poll was presented in a press conference in Washington by a leading figure, uh, Joseph Chirin-Chione, uh, he pointed out that if only people could influence their governments, uh, these issues might be settled, you know. <laughs> I, I think that's, 
probably true. And with regard to Cuba, it's about the same. Uh, if uh, our gestures are, we're going to maintain an embargo, which, as you know, but we're not allowed to know, uh, was established in order to punish you for disobedience, that's not much of a gesture. Thank you. Uh, our time is actually up, but in the spirit of the seminar, I might, to, and this is our last one, I might just extend our time for another five minutes. I did promise no one might have out by half past eight. But so many people have wanted to get in that I might just take two last quick comments or questions and a quick response, and then we'd call it a day or a night. John, and then this lady here. Uh, okay, this, this gentleman here. Sorry. I, I, I would, uh, there's not much time to discuss no, no. it. Can I, can I just yeah, sure. let this gentleman in with a, a quick question and maybe yeah. you can take both of them. Yes. With the uh, financial crash and the uh, questioning of the moral authority of Western elites, do you see any opportunities for social movements from yeah. below to challenge uh, matters along you know, lines such as drugs, incarceration, uh, ec economic distribution, and, and uh, environmental Who is that? One, two. Three. Okay. So the, uh, I, since there isn't really time to discuss it, let me just make a suggestion. Uh, I would suggest that you take your question and generalize it, not to the United States, but to any great power. Okay. So is the are the politics of any great power uh, undertaken out of a an, 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 an intention to create the benefit and the, you know, help the people of the world. I think it's, you, know, you have to really look hard to find examples. And the reason is essentially the uh, mafia principle that I mentioned. We have to extend it. Uh, great power actions don't take place in a social and economic va uh, vacuum. They're carried out effectively by the concentrations of power within the society. Now, that differs in different societies. Like in the old Soviet Union, it was the Kremlin, you know, party apparatus. In the United States, the corporate sector. OK, so if you want to understand uh, policies, a good place to look is the interests of those who formulate them. And it's very rare that they act in the interests of others. Who, who would expect that? And of course, the intellectual classes have to write a story which says they're always acting in the, in the interests of others out of pure altruism. But that's almost universal throughout history. So we discount it. And we ask what they're actually doing. And yeah, sometimes it happens to be beneficial to others. Uh, so take, say, humanitarian intervention, uh, use of force uh, in violation of international law. Well, if you take a look at the post-World War II period, you can find a few cases where uh, use of force uh, did put an end to major atrocities. Now, they don't enter into the canon. We don't talk about them. And the reason is because of who carried them out and what the US reaction was. Uh, the only two cases I know of of any significance are uh, the Indian invasion of uh, uh, East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, in 1971, which did stop uh, huge massacres, and the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia in 1979, which put an end to Pol Pot's atrocities just when they were peaking. So they had you know, very humane uh, consequences. Uh, were they humanitarian interventions? No, because those weren't the intentions. Those were the consequences. But why don't they enter into the canon? Well, because it wasn't us. We didn't carry it out. Uh, rather, it was them. And what they do can never be any good. Uh, furthermore, even worse, uh, the United States strongly opposed both of those interventions. It threatened war with India. It you know, sent aircraft carriers into the Bay of Bengal to threaten them for this crime. In the case of Vietnam, I mean, they were just bitterly denounced for putting Pol Pot's atrocities to an end. 
Uh, the U.S. supported a Chinese invasion to punish them for the crime. Uh, and the U.S. immediately turned to supporting Pol Pot. Well, okay, so therefore their intervention can't count as humanitarian. Uh, but uh, try to find some other examples. Uh, so yes, there are cases where the use of force happened to have uh, benign effects, uh, but not because it was carried out with uh, humane intent. And the cases don't count uh, unless we did them. But when we did them, it either succeeds in crushing resistance, in which case it's hailed as a great achievement, or it fails, in which case we say, well, it was a mistake. You know, our benign intentions were couldn't be realized. Uh, that's the canon of intellectual history. Uh, we see it right now, for example. So take, say, uh, Iraq, uh, and, and take a roughly comparable example, Chechnya. Okay. Uh, in Chechnya, uh, uh, first Yeltsin, then Putin, responded to Chechen terror, really significant Chechen terror in Russia, with a vicious invasion which destroyed the capital city, Grozny, you know, killed tens of thousands of people. Uh, and then, uh, according to US reporters who've been there, it ended up very successful. Uh, New York Times reporters visiting say, Grozny is a booming city. You know, construction everywhere, everybody has electricity, you know, no Russian troops around. It's run by Chechen security forces. I mean, there's some guerrillas off in the hill somewhere. But we don't call that a success, we call it a crime. Yeah, they succeeded in pacifying and reconstructing the country, and now it's working pretty well. And we consider it a crime, rightly. All right, now let's take the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Well, you know, if General Petraeus had been able to even minimally approach what Putin achieved in Chechnya, he'd probably be crowned king. Uh, you know, he hasn't been able to achieve that. But, you know, so instead of, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the country survives. I mean, Baghdad, for example, is a gated city, which people can't go from one place to another. And there's been massive ethnic cleansing. So killing has reduced, because there's nobody to kill anymore. Uh, the uh, um, uh, militias uh, have been uh, armed, trained, and funded. Uh, so they control their territory. So violence has reduced a little. The place is a total wreck. There's maybe a million people killed, You know, a couple of million displaced and refugees. But it's kind of, uh, you know, violence somewhat reduced. So not as successful as Putin in Chechnya, but, you know, to some extent uh, kind of uh, reduced the level of violence that we created in the first place. And that's praised acro across the spectrum. Say, so, okay, the question of uh, the surge, let's say, is settled because look how wonderful it was. I mean, nowhere near as wonderful as Putin in Chechnya, but uh, nevertheless, we did it, so it must be right even if the place is left a total wreck that may never recover. Well, okay, that's uh, it, the way within our doctrinal system we look at the use of violence by ourselves and others. And this translates to others. They do the same thing. Now, is the use of violence ever permissible? Well, I'm not an absolute pass An absolute pacifist would say no. I don't agree. But I think there's a very heavy burden of proof you want to use violence, whether it's a domestic dispute or uh, you know, international affairs, you have a very heavy burden of proof to meet. And I think if you look carefully, it's very hard to meet that burden. And the cases that are accepted, whether it's personal relations or international affairs, just don't stand up, almost without exception. Thank you. Noam, could you manage it? Yeah. A one-minute response to this man here. Well, I think it's a possibility. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, I mean, so things have happened which are really important. The, uh, you know, the ideological basis of the uh, kind of Anglo-American financial system has collapsed. Uh, nobody practically who's got a brain functioning now uh, talks about uh, uh, the efficient market hypothesis and, you know, the rational expectations model and all the things you taught in economics courses because it totally collapsed as it was bound to do. And it was been pointed out for years that it's got to collapse. So it did. So it's hard to reconstruct that ideology. Uh, does that mean that <coughs> popular movements can do something to change the world? Yeah, it means they can, but they're going to have to do it uh, because power centers have a very different idea in mind. In fact, if you want a good picture of, say, what the Obama administration has in mind, uh, take a look at the commentary by uh, Simon Johnson, 
a very conservative voice, former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund, uh, now an economist at MIT. There's an article in The Atlantic a couple of weeks ago, Atlantic Monthly. And I think it's pretty accurate, that's why I'm quoting him. <laughs> but uh, what he says is that the, basically the White House is in the pocket of the financial institutions, and they're making policy, which is not too surprising because they were Obama's main supporters during the campaign, and it usually works that way. So yeah, they're making policy, and their goal is to maintain the institutional structure as is, uh, with patching up here and there. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, William Black, who was the chief regulator at the, in the savings and loan crisis, in you know, the last major crisis, the Reagan-Bush crisis, uh, he says, you know, most of these guys ought to be put in jail. Uh, they're guilty of straight criminal fraud. Uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren, Harvard law professor, who's uh, the congressional monitor, has said pretty much the same thing. Uh, Johnson says, you know, we've got to take over the banks, uh, break them up, so there's no more too big, too big to fail insurance uh, policy and so on. But it's not going to happen as long as the White House is run by the financial institutions. Now, does this give an opening to social movements? Yeah. Uh, there are alternative possibilities to what Johnson suggests, not just break up the banks. Uh, and remember, there's a, uh, there's a similar recession and crisis in the manufacturing industry, serious one, not talked about as much. Uh, but uh, not just have the government take over the banks, but have the what are called the stakeholders take them over. Stakeholders means the community and the workforce. So they should be running the institutions whether it's banks or automobile companies or whatever, that's a possibility. And it's completely consistent with economic theory. In fact, you can look at the mainstream works in economics that point out that there's no law of nature that says that the management should be responsive to shareholders. They went on to stock, uh, sh stakeholders. And then that raises the next question, why shouldn't the stakeholders uh, elect the managers and replace them if they don't like them and run the things themselves? Well, you know, that's a possibility. So there are all kind of options that are possible, but they're not going to happen by themselves. And there are powerful forces resisting any change, uh, namely the people who essentially own the country. They want it to go back to what it was with them owning the country. Uh, so, yeah, there are opportunities, but opportunities have to be grasped. Thank you. Well, on that spirited note... <laughs> already expressed uh, your thanks and I'd just like to thank you all for coming. <laughs>